Wade. Edgar? Yes. Hi there, sir. How are you? I'll hold for you. Go ahead. All right. I'm all set. Ready for you. You're ready for me, but I'm ready for you, sir. Good oh, to be with you. Thank you so much. Let me make sure it's recording. We'll get started. All right, folks. We just remembered and honored the 70th anniversary of D-Day and the men in, that have sacrificed their lives for this country. And next summer marks the 70th anniversary of the most catastrophic naval disaster in our history. And we are fortunate enough to be able to talk to a survivor of that incident, the sinking of the USS Indianapolis. And Edgar Harrell has a new book. It's called Out of the Depths. And it is about this incredible story of survival, courage, and the sinking of that vessel. Edgar, how are you? I'm doing fine, sir. Thank you so kindly. Well, I appreciate you being with us. And, you know, we want to jump right into this because this is an amazing incident in our history. Uh, it's a tragic day, but uh, you're one of few that have uh, survived and then even less that are still with us today that can share this with us so it passes on to a new generation that can remember and never forget what happened on that day. So take us back to July 30th of 1945 and what the scene was like before the ship was hit with the two torpedoes. Okay, on uh, July the 26th, uh, we delivered the components of Fat Man and Little Boy to our B-29 base on the island of Tinian. And, of course, that was uh, the two atomic bombs that would be dropped at Hiroshima and Nagasaki on August the 6th and August the 9th. But on July the 30th, we had received orders at Senpak in Guam to go to the Philippines for the main invasion of Japan, which had taken place in November '45. But uh, three days out of Guam, unescorted, no underwater sound gear, we encountered a Jap sub. Commander Hoshimoto was waiting somewhat at the crossroads, and he could pick us up, but we could not detect him. So he picked us up some 10 miles out, and all he had to do was wait. He waited. He loaded uh, six torpedoes. He loaded one human torpedo, which would be two men in a caton, and he had two others that wanted to be loaded, and it would be a suicide mission, but he said he didn't want to expend the men if, in fact, he had a good target, and he knew he had a good target because we were just coming along nearly broadside of him, and so he had the crew to stand by. Uh, the code was red, wait, and fire, and every two seconds he fired a, a torpedo. He fired six, two of which hit us. The first one cut the bow of the ship off. When I said cut it off, I saw it. Uh, I was sleeping under the barrels of number one turret, and the second torpedo was back close to midship, and I no doubt a big gaping hole there, but no one lived to tell that story. Well, the ship went down in 12 minutes, and it's uh, a lot of history that follows from there, so I'll, I'll yield back to you. Well, it's just an amazing you know, holy cow, what what a thing to say. Um, there were 1,196 sailors on board. Only 879 were able to survive. And hypothermia, dehydration, starvation, and, of course, shark attacks. That was kind of, you know, kind of the basis of the story. Some people have heard of USS Indianapolis because of the, the Jaws rant by the character in the film that kind of at least you know, fictionalizes it a little bit, but at least sticks with some of the facts, and some people have heard of it because of that. And Edgar, here, here you are thrust into the uh, into the ocean, and, and there's just chaos and turmoil at this point. I mean, how do you even get off the boat? Okay, I'm going to correct you on one thing. There were 1,196 yes aboard, but 880 did not make it. We surmise that maybe 900 of us got in the water, but the Navy lost us. They ignored our SOSs. Uh, and they just had mud all over their face. They fibbed to us when they sent us out unescorted, knowing they knew that the Taman group of submarines were working in those waters. They knew that four days before we'd lost a destroyer and lost 129 boys. I cover all of this in my book. However, going back to the fact that uh, 900 of us got in the water meant that 300 uh, they were just uh, suddenly drowned below decks because the bow being cut off, we become a funnel. But of the 900 that got in the water, the Navy lost us. 
So literally, we swam with the sharks. Uh, dehydrated bodies, mass hallucination from drinking salt water, and 110 degree sun, and uh, we're swimming nearly constantly. I was in a group of 80, and uh, by the third day at noon, there's only 17 of us, so uh, you can use your own imagination and uh, wonder what in the world is taking place out there. I'll yield back to you, sir. Wow. And in the book, um, it's called Out of Depth, an unforgettable WW2 story of survival, courage, and the sinking of the USS Indianapolis. And Edgar Harrell is recounting that tragic moment when the ship went down and getting into the water. And now you're, you're kind of, you're stuck. I mean, as you say, the Navy did nothing for five days before we get to you in the water. And I mean, were there were there were there prayers being lifted up? Was it just hysteria? I mean, you mentioned hallucinations, and what else is sort of the scene in these water? I mean, did, I don't know about you. You speak to a certain, you know, some of the boys even seen some of these kind of sharks before, let alone know you're in the water with them. Well, there were sharks. Uh, well, the first morning, of course, we went down about fourteen minutes past midnight, and. Uh, we lost several boys before morning because many of them were, had multiple breaks in the body, been blown up against the bulkheads and maybe mass burns and so on. So we lost maybe a dozen boys before morning. But when morning came, um, we had uh, we had company. There were sharks swimming around us. You could see big fins uh, protruding out of the water, but seemingly out of fairness to them, they weren't attacking us. But it isn't wrong to someone maybe that had been injured. He has a high temperature, and he's hallucinating, and he can imagine that he sees an oasis out there, and he breaks out of the group, and he swims out to his imagination. And uh, you hear a blood-curdling scream, and you look, and uh, you see the capon go under, and then momentarily, then like a fish cork, a capon brings the body back to the surface. But then you see all kinds of fins, all the blood is attacking, attracting many, many sharks. Well, you dare not to go and check to see who your body might have been, but sometime later you check the different ones and you find out that the, the bottom torso is gone or he's been disemboweled. Maybe a leg or an arm is gone. So uh, we're going to experience that just many, many times the next uh, four and a half days, sir. How... um the book really starts to deal with your emotional trials and, you know, trying to keep your own well-being in order to, you know, help people stay as this group, keep keep together as sort of a pack now and that kind of thing. And um, w what are some of the things that are running through your head at this point? Okay, in order to stay together, we had a real problem because eight or ten foot swells and you come up on a swell and you, you know, you go one direction, your body maybe goes another so what we learned to do even the first day in order to stay together, and of course when we were surrounded by sharks, and that kind of drove us together, but how do we stay together? We kind of formed a circle, and we that were maybe more able-bodied would fasten our cape out jacket onto a buddy, and we'd form a circle, and we'd try to keep everyone in the circle. So as we'd go up on a big 10-foot swell and it would break, we would kind of drift uh, as a unit. And so we could stay together a little better that way. And then uh, um, when you had just a buddy with you, you could uh, kind of lock your legs together and uh, be able to uh, uh, at least relax a bit. But uh, nevertheless, you, you're you having to swim because a cape on jacket's not going to last four and a half days. It's the 48 hours, you, you're going to take it off and you're going to sit in it. But then you have to keep uh, swimming, so to speak, to keep your head uh, straight and keep that jacket under you or else it'll pitch you in the water. And then after a period of time, you don't have the energy to pull that um, cape on jacket down under you again. You mentioned some of the, you know, hallucinations and some of the stuff that's going on and, and um, were you, were you a, a prayerful man at the time? Were you were looking looking upwards for some help and support here, or is it just you're just still too focused on the moment? Okay, the only thing that any of us had in my group, uh, understand maybe there may have been two or three uh, uh, life rafts that floated up after the ship went down, and some uh, 
some found some of those later, but I never saw a life raft. I never saw a floater net. All I ever saw was a group of boys that uh, all they had was a K-Pop life jacket. And uh, then after a period of time, there was that many boys. We go through the first day when we are desperate for water because we're swimming 110 degree weather bareheaded and uh, we're desperate for water and some boys would dare to tear off some of their clothing and uh, try to strain some of that salt water and put their head under that and drink a little bit of that and say, well, it's uh, it's wet and it's about 85 degrees, so uh, they think maybe that it's going to do the job, but within the hour, you'd see what it did. they began to jerk and... Uh, and uh, be incoherent, and uh, you just wonder what in the world is happening. And after a little bit, maybe your buddy that you would have known, uh, he thinks you're an enemy. He may think you're a Jap, or he may think that you've got a canteen of water hidden in your cape on jacket. And in some cases, they would take out their sheath knife and maybe stab that buddy in the back in his cape pock. And, of course, then the blood, and then uh, more sharks. So... Things of that nature are happening all the time. And the first day, of course, we're desperate for water. A dehydrated body, you know, you just can't go on. And uh, yet we dare not uh, drink the salt water because we see what's happening. But sometime that second day, we had uh, a little rain cloud coming over. And you look and say, thank you, Lord. Look, it's raining. It's raining. So you open your mouth, heaven word, and... Maybe you can uh, get a, a few tablespoons full of water that kind of washes off of your uh, all-soaked face and lips, and your lips are parched and cracked open and bleeding and all of that salt water now getting into those, so you are you're, are so uncomfortable. But you get a little bit of, uh, of fresh water, a few tablespoons. We go through that second day losing boys every little bit, Third day at noon, there's 17 of us still left. Now, you can use your own imagination now as to what all has taken place, but it's a, it's a combination of all of the above, so to speak. But uh, there were 17, and uh, now we realize we can't make it unless we can get close enough to the Philippines that someone will see us. Because uh, we knew by now our SOSs had been ignored because uh, we were supposed to met the Idaho the next morning. Well, this is two days past now, and we see planes flying over at 30,000 feet bombing Tokyo, but no one's looking for us. So uh, we 17 is that, you know, we, any of us that would pray audibly, would pray audibly, and some that maybe did not know even to whom they would be praying to, but... They nevertheless, and I say there's no such thing as an atheist in foxhole. They prayed too, but a prayer like this, I can hear this one say to now, God, if you're out there, I don't want to die. I've got a son back home I've never seen. We can't make it unless we can get help. We have to get help. Someone has to see us. Uh, we, none of us are going to live. Wow. Praise God. Wow. That's amazing that... It shows about the human spirit and the human nature, and this is the stuff that comes out in this amazing book, folks, that you've got to get a copy of. It is Out of Depth, the Unforgettable World War II Story of Survival, Courage, and the Sinking of the USS Indianapolis. And Edgar Harrell is discussing the events of that day and the first few days in the water and the, just the incredible conditions and, and the response of the men that are in the water trying to survive. And once you... I mean, how does the rescue sort of transpire then, Edgar? I mean, at what point do you start to, I mean, obviously you had two more days to that. Conditions continue to deteriorate and getting worse. You're kind of trying to move towards the Philippines, as you say. And tell us about that moment where you start to see something. Well, okay, uh, uh, I, I was at the point where there was a 17 of us, and, and we had had a, a real prayer meeting, and we knew that someone had to help us, a higher power had to help us, that we aren't going to live. And so we're pouring our hearts out to the Lord, and after a period of time, we came upon a swell, and we looked and said, Look, look, there's something out there that looks like a raft. Well, after a period of time, uh, a little raft came into our group of uh, five sailors around a makeshift of a raft. 
But when they came into our group, we could see no one is on the raft. Why not? Why no one's on the raft? Well, when they came into our group, we could see why. It wouldn't hold anyone. Uh, the little raft is made of two 40-millimeter ammunition cans and uh, two or three old slatted like, potato crate or slatted orange crates. Wow. They had those lashed together, and they'd taken K-pop jackets off of boys already expired and put them up on, squeezed them out, and put them up on that little raft. And so they said that we've got a spare tire. Well, when they came into our group, then uh, they could see that by now we are seated in our K-pop jackets, and they showed us how we could take our jackets off and uh, take one that at least is a little drier, but at least hold a little more water, and we exchanged a bit, and they said, anyone want to join us? We've got to get close enough to the Philippines because we see planes flying at 30,000 feet, but we've got to get closer to the Philippines. Anyone want to join us? And I say to my Marine buddy, Spooner, Spooner, I'm going to go with them. He says, Harold, if you go, I'm going with you. So two sailors join five uh, sailors, and we're going to push a little raft to the Philippines. Now, we didn't know it was another 500 miles, but when you see your group of 80 go down to 17, it's, it's time to do something. So we joined them, and we started uh, out, and we were making some headway. No one was on the raft. But we had spare tires, so to speak, on that raft. And we're plugging away, and sometime later that uh, day in the afternoon, we could look out and we saw a little makeshift of a, of a something out there. We wondered, uh, is that just an old crate? Well, wonder what it could be. And there was a compelling influence that said, go and see what it is. So I told my brothers, I said, I'm going to swim out and get that, that maybe it could be some food or maybe it could be some water. And so I uh, did a dog paddle and went out and uh, got that. And when I got within six feet or so of that, I could see the rotten potatoes floating in that old potato crate. And in desperation, I reach in and get a hold of that first potato. But somewhat in the agony of defeat, all of that rot was squeezing between my fingers. And I thought, rotten potatoes. But uh, it was solid on the inside. So I take my hands and I peel that potato, then I take my mouth and peel it some and don't spit out all the rot. I'm desperate for some water or some food. And then I begin to think, I've got to uh, fill my dungaree pockets full of these, uh, you know, for, for later and for my buddies. And then I began to swim back with that old potato crate with still a lot of potatoes in it. My buddies hollered out, what is it? Rotten potatoes. But they left a raft and they came out and joined me. And all we had though was some rotten potatoes, but they were solid on the inside. We had a little food and a little water, and that's all the water then that I had for four and a half days, and yet was swimming most of the time. Now, let's go through that day. We go to the last day. Now, many things happened between then and the last day. The last day, though, I'm with a Navy lieutenant and one sailor. And the sailor, I saw him doing what I had seen so many times, and I often say, it's much easier to die than it is to live. And I saw that he was willing to just let his head drop in the water. His cape on jacket would not hold him up completely out of the water. And I shook him, and he was still alive, but he could care less. I checked him the second time, same thing. The third time, uh, is too late. He'd already dropped his head in the water, and now he's gone. So it's just McKissick and myself. And after a period of time, uh, we are struggling now. We have our cape out jackets down under us, but we're having to keep uh, swimming to keep ourselves erect, or else that cape out will pitch us in the water. And then all of a sudden, I said, I hear a plane! I hear a plane! Look! Look! I see a plane! And here was a plane going to fly over us, and the uh, he was two or 3,000 feet up, but we waved, we splashed water, we hollered, we did everything imaginable. But if he knew we were down there, impossible for him to see us. Let me just explain that. Here he's flying, let's say, 4,000 feet. He's looking forward of him, say, uh, uh, four miles. He's looking out his peripheral vision each side, uh, two and a half miles. He's looking at 20 square mile. And to see a man's head down there, impossible for him to see us. But in the providence of God, he saw us. Let me tell you how he saw us. 
Lieutenant Gwen flying that Ventura. I called it the B-25 with wheels on it. And the here, he was having trouble with his radio antenna. And he says to the co-pilot, take over controls. Uh, we're having trouble with that radio antenna. And I'm going to go back and I'm going to uh, pull that in and put a little stabilizer on it, on it or else we can't reach back to base. And as he leaves the, the cockpit and goes aft, he opens the bomb bay door and just glances down a split second. He rushes back to take over control of the plane, and the crew says, What is it? What do you see? He says, Look down there. And they look down there. They couldn't see anything, but what Lieutenant Gwynn saw was, uh, I often say, it was, it was the little boy scout's mirror. He saw the sun hitting the oil off of our clothing and the debris down there. And to him, that meant that there's a Jap sub in distress down there. He loaded the bombs. We think he sees us. Look, he's coming in. He's coming in. And he was coming in. But he was coming in loaded, ready to uh, drop his, uh, his bombs on whatever might have been down there. But when he got down in that, maybe that, uh, you know, up uh, a couple of thousand yards, uh, 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 then he began to see sharks in the water, long, big sharks. And as he got closer down, he could see sharks attacking boys. And so I see him, though, as he comes down and uh, he circles us a few times. I can see his visage in that cockpit now as he circled us three or four times, and then he goes back up. Well, I wonder, well, what's he going back up there for? He goes back up so that he could reach back at base in Peru to announce ducks on the pond. Now, no one knew whose ducks were out there, but uh, he gets in touch with a PBY uh, pilot, Adrian Marks, and Marks, an uh, hour and a half later, 150 miles later, he comes on the scene. He could land. He asked permission to land, and he was told, no way do you land that big goose in the open sea landing with eight-foot swells. But he argued the point that there's boys down there being mauled by sharks, and he hung up on his command in, uh, in Peru, and he set that big goose down. He circled us a few times. He hit that first swell. He bounced up in the air. Later we find out that he knocked the motor completely out. He ruptured the pontoon. But he set it down, and he began to run those swells and to pick up survivors. It isn't long I knew he picked up McKissick, and then later then he picks me up. But he picked up 56. You might say, it won't hold 56. Well, it will if you tie seven out on the wings, and there were seven. I've got a buddy down in Chattanooga that was one of the seven on the wings. Okay, from there then, there's a destroyer that comes in later that night. We're transferred aboard the destroyer. <clears throat> and then we're taken to Palau to the hospital, later to the hospital in in Guam. Okay, I'll yield back to you, sir. Well, I regret, <clears throat> yeah, I almost don't even want to. I just want to keep listening. I feel like I'm there, and this is just an amazing story, folks. Uh, the USS Indianapolis going down uh, in 1945, and Edgar Harrell recounting these moments, recounting the uh, the rescue that the Navy finally is able to pull off days later and just the sheer act of God being involved in every, every movement here, every, every piece of this to, uh, you know, to save 880 lives. It's, it's just incredible. And, um, Mr. Mr. Harold, just don't, don't stop. If you, if you don't mind, just keep going. And, um, just, you know, you, you're, you're finally rescued. And the next part is, is, is just got to, just it's just so the whole thing is just so life changing. But how how was the the next part of this when you finally uh, you're all back together? They're trying to you know count heads. I mean, how how do they try to reconcile you know who they have and where everybody is? Were you asking the question? I I, I right now I'm in such awe of the story, sir. I'm trying. <laughs> um, yeah, just you know, kind of is it, you know what happens next as far as. You know, once you get back, and, and, and they're kind of doing, are they do, 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 do they do a head count, or how do they approach trying to uh, get everybody together? I, I'm not understanding you, sir. I'm hard hearing. Okay, I'm sorry. I was just trying to ask. You know, as far as what ne what's next, how do they 
reconcile getting everybody together and treating injuries and all of that? Is that is that pretty much how this how, what follows next? Well, uh, I was in the hospital in in Peru. And they brought me to the hospital in Guam. I'm in the hospital there now. This is July the thirtieth, and picked up uh, four and a half to five days later, and uh, I finally made it back to the states uh, on October the second. And thinking that I was going to be leaving for home on October the fourth, but October the the third, I ended up in Balboa Hospital in San Diego. I had a perforated appendix and. Uh, they rushed me in thinking that I would have an operation, but when they checked my blood count, they said, no way can we operate now, and um, found out that uh, my white blood was of such. They said, we have to give you some penicillin, which was new then, and it was 29 days later before they could operate. They gave me 11,800,000 units of penicillin. Okay, I'm still in the hospital through Thanksgiving, through Christmas, through New Year's, until January the 16th. Now, from July 30, rescued, you know, four and a half days later, still in the hospital. But uh, I, I'm, I beat that one, so to speak. The good Lord was with me, and I survived that. And uh, now, in the last few years, I've traveled the country here in the U.S. telling the story of God's providence in my life and the life of the uh, we 317 that survived, of which 36 of us are still living. Of the 39 Marines aboard, only nine survived. Only two of us are living today. Wow, that's amazing. And my book now, uh, the new book that just came out recently, it's going viral all over the U.S. today. And I'm being interviewed like this uh, many, many times every week, and I'm traveling all over the U.S. in speaking venues. So uh, I'm looking forward to meeting many, many people here in these next few months. All right, sir. Are you still with me? I'm I am. I am, and I just wanted to say thank you one last time, and uh, thank you again for this. You know, sharing so much of this with us, and uh, you know, and sharing your book and, and doing what you did to write the book. I appreciate it so much. All right. Well, it's an honor to be on your program, sir. Thank you so kindly. All right. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye bye.